Candy for Christmas is a bonus story, which comes with some editions of the first Hannah Swenson book. It's about 100 pages long, and it comes complete with bonus recipes. Specifically, nine recipes, and they are all three to five pages long. That's about 30 pages of recipes. So the novella is 100 pages if you're a chef, and 70 pages for the rest of us who can't cook. Argofunk book review, Argofunk book review. This review was commissioned through Patreon. Patreon, please give me your money. The story starts shortly after the first book ends. It's Christmas time. Hannah goes to her cookie shop one day, only to discover the lights are on and somebody broke in through the back door. The burglar is still inside, but Hannah doesn't call the police because it's freezing outside. She doesn't want to hang out in the cold. Brrr. So she goes in and the burglar runs away. Hannah decides it's probably not a burglar because they did all the dishes, mopped the floor, and left behind recipe number one. Give Hannah Swenson a recipe and you get a free pass for criminal activity. Hannah and Norman go out on a date where they have a conversation about 17th century English metaphysical poets. Hannah says the poets remind her of recipe number two. They stop by the store on the way home and meet the burglar. It's a runaway teenager named Candy Roberts. They talk with Candy while eating recipe number three. Candy's father is a veterinarian who died recently. Candy says she's 20, but it's pretty obvious she's not. Hannah doesn't want Candy sleeping out in the cold, so she hires Candy as a waitress in exchange for free room and board. Hannah wants to ask Bill about the police's procedures for runaway teenagers. Andrea answers the phone. She mentions that Mike thinks Hannah is funny, and he loved their bowling date so much he's going to ask her out again. Whoa, but she just went on a date with Norman tonight! Hannah is seriously dating two guys at the same time? Wow. Book number two is going to be a huge love triangle, isn't it? Either way, I am clearly overthinking this section of the novella. It's just a joke about how Andrea is a date warning system. I wish I had one of those. Since Bill isn't home, Hannah goes to visit him at the station. She brings recipe number four with her. Hannah lectures Bill on the historical origins of the phrase dead as a doornail, which Shakespeare used in Henry IV, and that makes two conversations about literature close together. Is this a cookbook or an English major book? Of course, Mike is at the police station. He asks Hannah out on a date. Mike and Bill explain that when the police catch a runaway minor, they get taken to child protective services. If the parents or guardians can't be located, the child usually gets raised in the county's children's home until they're a legal adult. Andrea is a better detective than her husband, the actual police detective, so she figures out that Candy is a runaway. She agrees to help find Candy's mother, and they come up with a fake backstory for Candy, just in case anybody wonders why a teenager is working for slash living with Hannah. They talk with Candy. She writes down recipe number five and recipe number six. Candy knows them because she has a photographic memory. She remembers lots of things. Why, she even remembers her father's phone number, which is 814-8441. Wow, Candy, you are doing a terrible job of hiding your real identity. Candy cooks up recipe number seven with Andrea's daughter, and there's a somewhat funny scene where Bill shows up for coffee, and Candy screams that Hannah called the police on her. Off screen, Andrea solves the mystery by calling the phone number with different area codes until she gets the right one. Candy is from Des Moines, Iowa. She ran away when her mother got remarried because she doesn't think she can compete with her new stepsister. Candy has never met her stepsister, which gives Hannah an idea. There's an upcoming Christmas party. Hannah is making recipe number eight for it. Hannah volunteers Candy to help set up for the party. The other volunteer is her stepsister, Allison. The two girls decorate for hours, they become best friends. Candy is shocked when she learns Allison's really her stepsister. They go out to the hall to talk to their parents, and the end. Post-book follow-up. Oh, okay, I guess we don't need to see Candy get reunited with her family. Sure, let's just end the story early. Instead... We get a half page where Norman and Hannah say it looks like everything will be okay. And hey, did you try out recipe number nine? 
I hate to be a jerk about the recipes, but jeez, this novella has more recipes than the 300-page book it's attached to. The main book has two-page recipes, but this one has three to five-page recipes. They come complete with a decorative border and notes from Hannah, sometimes multiple notes. This different formatting makes the recipes feel like an excuse to pad out the short book's length. Although, to be fair, I wouldn't mind eating some of the candies. Yum. As a mystery, this isn't as good as the book it's attached to, mainly because Hannah does no investigation into who Candy is. Andreo solves the mystery off-screen with one clue. It's a little surprising that Hannah isn't more invested in solving the mystery. And generally speaking, if your detective isn't invested in solving the mystery, it's hard for readers to get invested in solving the mystery. Overall, it's an okay little story, short and sweet. It's definitely a bonus novella, though. It's not good enough to be sold on its own as a separate book. I would have given it more focus on the mystery and characters as opposed to the recipes. I'm going to give it the average score. I give Hannah Swenson mystery number 1.5, Candy for Christmas, a 5 out of 10.